everybody good evening and very warm welcome to this international webinar and icsc forum on the topic sustainability education in covid era uh, this is being organized as you all know on the eve of the world environment day which is most significant occasion to raise awareness about environmental issues and environmental action we all know that this year's day is celebrated across the globe cause day is tomorrow but this program is on the eve of the world environment day and theme is biodiversity and uh, i think covid 19 biodiversity and education all these three dimensions that we will be dealing in this webinar are quite interlinked Uh, this is also the slogan is time for nature so i have a brief uh, a presentation so let me just share it uh, screen share you cannot share a screen uh, while other participants is sharing so, uh, i think bhavesh you have to stop sharing please go ahead sir then i can share uh, this please one yes this is the the forum world environment day 2020 webinar you can just see this uh what is this forum uh, icsc international conference on sustainability education was organized last year in september and uh, as a follow up of most of you might be knowing about this conference i, I think everybody must have attended it uh, we have a website still running on the icsc and uh, this was the forum was created as a follow up of the recommendations of the conference during the fourth technical advisory committee held on 31st october 2019 under the chairmanship of mr kartikeya sarabhai the objective is to provide a platform for continuing exchange of ideas and networking within the partners and participants of the conference and for providing strategic direction and leadership to strengthen sustainability education within national regional and international professions and development of future activities in the area so this is very important at this meeting this con webinar is the first one uh, event of the forum and of course world environment day uh, as we have been just now informally talking uh, this uh, the theme is biodiversity we are going to celebrate biodiversity for next few days of course there is world environment week uh, in many institutions being organized and time for nature is the slogan 2020 was considered to be the super year for the environment and nature because there was this several launches several commitments were to be renewed the global biodiversity framework 2030 was to be launched and education for sustainable development 2030 framework this was also uh, supposed to be launched and then there was the review of the progress on sustainable development goals and of course the review of the paris climate agreement but now covid 19 and many other crises has almost delayed action on all these fronts and this this is defining new set of norms and rules and let us hope for the next decade what is covid 19 is going to define it as well as other environmental crises climate change biodiversity esg and others for the next whole decade uh the context is the covid-19 right now because it's greatest disruption reshaping education 1.3 billion learners are not able to attend schools colleges and universities this is according to unesco 
new normal online meetings informal learning many values uh working from home offices and teaching learning spaces are coming up technology is great equalizer it is being considered as well as multiplier but uh, online teaching learning have become nightmare for many we are listening hearing many problem many glitches in both the connectivity as well as the devices and another challenge is for the particularly education system is the evaluation and examinations how of course which is very very important part of education system so all these issues are uh, uh, countries are facing in this scenario this esg 2030 which we will be discussing in this webinar uh in fact there are three of course it's a kind of we had a decade of esd then there was gap which was till last year and the united nations general assembly as well as unesco adopted esd for 2030 and there are these three main pillars of this whole uh, individual community as well as technology these three Uh, premises on which this whole ESG 2030 is built. What, first is the awareness is not enough. More attention to learners transformation process. This is at the individual level transformation which is needed. More attention to deep structural causes for unsustainable development at the community level, at the uh, regional, national, and international level. and this is where this whole covid context is very very relevant then technology which is technological advances which is defining the future and this is a uh, in nutshell the framework and uh, this is the vision is defined by the un general assembly resolution and which says that esd for 2030 is to build a more just and sustainable world through the achievement of 17 sdgs and uh, education 2030 agenda is to place greater emphasis on the contribution of learning content to the survival and prosperity of humanity so these these uh, this uh, is a whole framework in nutshell uh, but i am not going to of course during discussions it, it will come at uh, come up at multiple times but basically this is uh, in essence which is unesco has developed and is it will be launched it was supposed to be launched uh, in a uh, international event in bonn uh, this year but it's postponed now for the next year mobius foundation unesco and fe we were going to do a seminar during the a uh, side event during this uh, launch of the event but hopefully we will do it in, next year and uh, about this webinar uh, this is as i already said uh, we are targeting the principles i think we have close to around 150 principles who have, who have confirmed joining this webinar and we will be discussing basically in two days first day is the the opening session and principles conclave and once these uh, speeches by eminent dignitaries are done then Uh, the principles will be divided into 10 concurrent sessions and they will be del deliberating on various aspects we have uh, already identified four thematic areas on which these 10 uh, concurrent sessions will be held and day 2 will be the concluding session when where the outcome of these concurrent sessions will be shared as well as the, from the eminent speakers we will have their view points and the conclusion for the whole two days event so this is all that i wanted to share with you and uh, this is a uh, you all know how the youth young voices uh, are uh, all over the world they are being heard they are the louder voices voices uh, and uh, greta and uh, so many uh, and they are defining the sustainability education Uh, to a large extent now i would like to uh, invite the chief guest of this uh, international webinar 
Mr. Atul Bagai, Director, United Nations Environment Program, India Office. Uh, Mr. Bagai, I know him for many years. He's a very good uh, friend of mine. We worked together while he was in the government. I had uh, interacted with him a lot. And very recently, uh, we together worked in a uh, transboundary uh, project uh, involving Nepal, Bhutan, and India, three countries, on the biodiversity and resilience building, which is, uh, I think, in the COVID context, is so important. We are still uh, discussing about that program. Mr. Bagai has a very checkered career. He joined uh, envi uh, UN Environment Programs, Ozone Action Program, under the Mont Montreal Protocol as Regional Officer for South Asia in 2000 served as senior regional coordinator to build capacity of regional networks in Asia and enable them to meet the compliance targets. He has worked very extensively on various environment. I think the ozone, the Mantle Protocol is one of the most successful uh, multilateral agreements uh, so far. He has worked with the government of India in very senior capacities. Uh, we are really, really proud and privileged to have you, Mr. Bagai, and uh, we would like uh, request you to uh, deliver your inaugural address, Mr. Atul Bagai. Thank you, uh, Ram Bujji, and I hope uh, everyone can hear me. Absolutely. I would first like to uh, thank uh, Ram Bujji and Barman Saab uh, for giving me this chance and inviting me for uh, this inaugural uh, on a very important evening uh, which is the evening before the World Environment Day tomorrow and uh, as Ram Bujji had said the theme this year is uh, biodiversity and I think when the theme was being finalized uh, by our headquarters uh, I don't think they had any idea how important this issue would become on the actual day of the World Environment Day uh, when we are all facing this amazing pandemic that has uh, really taken over our entire life, not only in a particular country, but all over the world. And it has brought out so many new challenges. And one challenge is that we are organizing this event the way it is being organized online. Otherwise, normally we would have met face to face and organized a discussion uh, around a particular theme. But it's, it's a new world that we are seeing. It's a new world that we are entering into and it is changing the paradigm in all the sectors, including the issue that is under being under consideration the sustainability education. I am also very thankful uh, to Karthike, who is also going to give the keynote speech with whom we've been working together for almost uh, two and a half decades. And I, I would like to start uh, my inaugural by uh, reminding everyone about the UN Decade of Education for Sustainable Development, which was 2004 to 2014. And I, I still remember Kartike had organized a huge conference at uh, Indabad, which I had also attended. And that decade spurred many countries, environment education organizations, civil society organizations, governments, to reorient their whole education focus towards sustainable development and sustainability. In fact, that was one of the first major initiative of bringing sustainable education uh, to the doorsteps of uh, the student community and to the doorsteps of uh, the education. And in fact, at the end of the decade, report also uh, was brought out which stated that a solid foundation has been laid for uh, education for sustainable development. The issue I'm wanting to highlight is if the sustainability education has been growing or has grown at an arithmetic rate as the end of the decade report stated, 
how is it that environmental degradation climate change species extinction they are all growing at a geometric pace meaning if we are making people aware of sustainability issues if we are making kids aware of sustainability issues the governments the civil society organizations and the citizenry how is it that this education instead of leading to more sustainability has led over the last two decades to more environmental degradation and that's a very important area for all of us the environmental community and the education community to really look at uh, when uh, we are also ending not only the decade of biodiversity but we are also going to start on 1st january 2021 a decade of ecosystem restoration in fact 2020 is being called the super year of nature the theme is biodiversity and i think no other incident has brought this whole focus on biodiversity and ecosystem as the corona 19 the i i I'll, I'll, i'll try to draw a small parallel between what corona does to us and what we are trying to do to our planet in fact a lot of people are saying that the human beings the community itself is more or less like corona as far as the planet is concerned as the corona virus invades its host and disturbs the natural order in that system i think mankind human beings have done more or less a similar kind of a uh, disruption in in the natural order in the nature in our ecosystem uh, to the detriment of our planet and all the species that live within it and we have forgotten one very key <coughs> principle that sustainability is about maintaining a healthy balance between people and environment so what has this covid 19 uh, done to us what is this new paradigm the lockdown in which we all have been over the last 3 months what has it taught us and how does it help us in taking uh, sustainability education in this whole new paradigm of course some of the important lessons that we have learned are to do more with less uh, less is being uh, generated consumption levels probably have gone down though water use probably has uh, increased uh, there are no baseline studies or other studies done as such as as of now but certainly uh, it would not be wrong to say that carbon emissions have reduced uh, but it has also brought out a very important fact that mankind has started appreciating the biodiversity the ecosystem much more than what they were probably doing before the pandemic set in within this whole scenario unep uh, has tried to see how we can address the whole issue of sustainability education uh, and bring school children and higher educational institutions uh, to bear upon the new way of learning and we've launched two initiatives in the recent past and i'm very happy to say a lot of you have been partnering with us uh, in the last few months on these two uh, initiatives one of course is the tight turners plastic challenge program where wwf and cee are our uh, major partners and we almost have 100000 youth participating in this program uh, and uh, another thing uh, another initiative which is our gift to the world uh, for this world environment day is the earth school that tomorrow the hrd minister is going to launch where he's linking the earth school with the diksha platform of the ministry of health uh, human uh, resources and we are hoping that through this earth school we would be able to bring children much closer to the biodiversity Uh, and nature of course this is an oxymoron almost to be saying that through online system we are going to bring the kids and children closer to the biodiversity and nature 
which means basically that on the online system they would be learning all this whereas if you really want to learn about biodiversity and nature you really need to go out and be amongst uh, nature and be amongst the biodiversity and i think this kind of a contradiction is what is going to govern the whole uh, system of education especially sustainability education in the coming years i'll conclude now uh, with uh, some uh, points in terms of uh, this how this new paradigm will impact on the sustainability education and what are the challenges uh, that uh, we would be facing of course ram bujji in his opening uh, presentation has highlighted few of them uh, but if our if our education system in the future is going to be online uh, how successful can that be uh, is certainly a, a parameter that needs to be uh, looked at Uh, would we be in a position to reach all parts of india india being such a diverse and large country with various levels of digital access uh, how would we be able to take our message uh, to everyone knowing very well how our traditional systems of education have still not been able to reach uh, man as uh, the so i i think considering the digital access in rural areas we'll also need to see that any website website based initiative will need to be planned with a lot of care uh, also we would need if zoonotic diseases are going to increase unless we are to mitigate uh, ecosystem losses and biodiversity losses uh that would mean that uh, our education has to be more technology oriented uh, and it has to be technology based approach to education and finally what does it mean for our students uh, environment education certainly does as i earlier said all for touch and feel field experience is the one that is known to change behavior among youth but can we in the present circumstances uh, have any of that Uh, that is going to be a big big challenge in, in online education where we are looking at sustainability issues being addressed these were some of the areas i wanted to touch uh, in my inaugural address and i also wanted to thank everyone for inviting me and also uh, <coughs> for a very successful deliberation over the last two days this was a very heavy agenda and such serious and important elements of Uh, discussion that have been chalked out, and uh, I am sure we will have very fruitful discussions. I would like to end here and wish every one of you a very happy World Environment Day tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Atul ji. I think uh, uh, you brought forward very important uh, points here for uh, giving the direction to the uh, webinar. and the one thing which is uh, so important is that you mentioned about the uh, the access issue of access the digital access in uh, areas uh, those areas how to reach out to them and uh, how to bridge that digital divide the other one is of course the occurrence of zoonotic diseases which is very much linked to the biodiversity and nature and how education can respond to this uh, very challenging issue thank you very much atul ji i think uh, we will be discussing much more about uh, the of course tight turners uh, we we have been uh, collaborating with the ok leagues and uh, but this earth school is very interesting and tomorrow we will be hearing your colleague uh, miss gayatri uh, raghava about this whole initiative and that would be i hope very exciting uh, to hear tomorrow uh, now i would like to uh, invite uh, uh, padma shri uh, shri kartikeya sarabhai uh, in fact uh, uh, i have whatever i am today i would uh, give credit to uh, kartik bhai Uh, he is a great mentor he is a friend philosopher and guide uh, to be true to me and uh, whatever uh, deliberation 
today is our whatever initiative today this whole icsc forum is his brain child because he was who advised about this the whole icsc was his uh, initiative and he put all his uh, energy and effort into that uh, i think we need not uh, everybody he is well known uh, in the field of environment education i would like to mention here only one thing that uh, uh, in 2002 when i was uh, with the kartik bhai in the world summit of development in johannesburg we together with almost i think there were around 25 international organizations lobbied for this whole decade for education for sustainable development and the whole this sustainability education movement which is uh, now has taken a deep root into education system is initiated at that time so kartikeya sarabhai has been involved right from the very inception of the esd and sustainability education and whatever globally and nationally we are every environment education uh, education for sustainable initiative he is very much deeply linked and involved uh, i would now request uh, uh, kartik bhai to take the floor and address uh, deliver his keynote address kartik bhai over to you thank you for that uh... nice introduction uh, i think it's wonderful to be with colleagues i would like to compliment pradeep ji pradeep barman rambuj and his colleague and also atul bagai a, a friend philosopher for a long time uh, and the type of initiative which uh, the unep takes uh, atul you might not realize but i was just putting together a list of all the things he is doing tomorrow and we have something like 18 different events which i will send you a list because everyone feels equally with unep we never look upon unep as a as an outside body but we look upon all of us as being part of the larger movement which was um, i suppose started way back in 72 when uh, when the whole idea of unep i uh, came came forward atul ji mentioned a very interesting thing in his talk he said he put a challenge what is it that in spite of environmental education and esd we still see this growth of um, uh, of of uh, loss of biodiversity uh, the, the 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 carbon the climate challenge the pollution everything is happening and in terms of some of the new tech new language which all of us understand today which is what is called flattening the curve and i think atul ji what we need to look at is that through this educational impact have we in fact flattened the curve or have we have we not had an impact and i think it would make a wonderful study and so from your remarks i think we should do it i have been asked that since 92 when india made it a compulsory subject has that generation's footprint really gone down or what has happened but let us talk about today we are in a very difficult time With with some silver lining, but a very difficult time. Many of our fellow citizens have had unbearable hardship. Uh, people who are migrants, uh, people you've got these sad stories of people trying to walk all the way from say one end of India to, uh, to another. We've had uh, young girls, the story of bicycling. Rambuj and you both mentioned about uh, the digital uh, space being uh, an equalizer, which it really can be. but at the same time uh, there are many problems we had the sad story this morning of a young girl in kerala who doesn't have connectivity and felt that because she could not join the webinar she committed suicide it is heartbreaking uh, to to see that happen so let us understand that in sustainability that chart which was briefly put up by someone today which is that we have the social economic and the environment as as three circles of sustainability and sustainability education in that sense needs to really address all of these three together the challenge of uh, of sustainability in terms of health and economics is before all our policy makers should we open or should we not open 
Should we should we rely on individuals? And when you say open, it again goes back to people, because unless people behave in a different way, unless there is behavioural change, you cannot open the system. And I think uh, that really brings in the whole concept of education. That today the type of challenges we have does require education as a as a fundamental component. It might not be enough, but it is certainly a critical part of it. Uh, you must all realize that uh, in 2015, when we went for the climate change uh, agreement in Paris, uh, the Indian government and our prime minister especially emphasized the whole concept of, of lifestyle, the change in, change in lifestyle that was required. And India was responsible for ensuring that this went into the introduction of the Paris agreement for the first time, because UN documents and you don't like to talk about lifestyles and the minute you talk about lifestyles you are talking about again education and what what people what what people require at the same time as what we are seeing the hardships all of us know and there is any number it's not fully documented but the tremendous change in environmental factors like pollution uh, which is very obvious but also the amount of carbon which is which is being emitted human activity of just transport, just moving around, contributes such a huge amount uh, to, uh, to, the, to the footprint which we have. Uh, uh, industry is slowing down, people doing things differently. And we also see how resilient uh, nature really is. And Atulji mentioned about the next decade starting on January on resilience and, and the restoration of ecosystems. But ecosystem restoration with a decrease or a more respectful human activity can in fact be very, very, very fast. So I think we need to look at that. Another thing COVID has really taught us and this whole crisis is that we used to look upon the threats at our scale. Uh, we looked upon um, the whole concept of what would be happening we, when we talk about nature and biodiversity. Most people think about the uh, 9 million or so uh, species of animals and trees and other things which you know, and really don't talk about the trillion species of microbes. Now the microbes is so much part of the reality of humans and viruses which are somewhere on the borderline of living and non-living. <coughs> we don't look upon them as a reality as much as we've had to now. We talk about it as the invisible enemy, but that is what it is. And uh, we are, along with, uh, with UNEP's uh, guidance, we are, we are launching tomorrow, Atulji, uh, the Mighty Microbe uh, 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 seminar, workshop, which will go on. Uh, people understanding that what all of us are, even in our guts and everything else, we probably have two kgs of microbes in our body. So who we call Kartike or who you call uh, whatever name, we are not just ourselves, but our whole system uh, works uh, works with all the positive microbes, uh, which, which uh, we are thinking of new new ways in which we, which we educate, new ways in which we, we bring people together. So I think what, what is happening as we go forward is it has been a pause and many people have questioned the type of activities which they do, the type of thing which they do, and what, what is the future uh, going to be? What is the future of education going to be? Thanks to this uh, way of reaching out to people through, through, uh, through webinars and things, we've been having a two-week intensive work in 10 villages in Gujarat, trying to see if can we make every person in that village be able to join a webinar. And day before yesterday, I had the first one, and it was just wonderful to see people, some of them not necessarily educated or literate, in, but very wise, who are discussing farming practices and water practices uh, in the villages of Jastan using this medium. This medium enables us to contact and work with the best in the world and bring them to schools. So I think we are opening up a whole new digital possibilities if we do it right. And if we make people literate in being able to use this medium, because this medium also requires a certain literacy in terms of how you go 
how you go, go forward. We also need to uh, take on the responsibility. The whole equity issue has to be re-looked at. The role of male, female, and gender issues. I think many men, for the first time, have even respected uh, what their homes were like and what type of other work was going on. Uh, it was the thing. We are also seeing outside my window, I have a parrot family and I've had a hornbill family. And it's been fascinating to see it, it through this whole period. And the type of emotions which they seem to show uh, is also a different way that I who have been in nature, who have been doing bird watching, have been doing everything else, find how fascinating this is. So I think it's a new era. We should take it in a positive way. I think the two initiatives which we are fortunate to be able to work with UNEP, the, both the Plastic Titan and the Earth School, are really great initiatives. And I would think that, uh, again, thanking uh, ICSC to put us all, all together. Uh, uh, there is another initiative I'll mention before I just close, which is that the Action for Climate Empowerment, which is the educational initiative of the UN uh, uh, Climate Change Convention, uh, that is also looking at education in a much more serious way. We have a, on the 8th of June, there is a global discussion, which we will see that all of you get the link. Uh, I'm supposed to speak very briefly on behalf of civil society, but I think the whole role that civil society, NGOs, educational institutions will play as we go forward is going to be, is going to be very much more. And I think the type of initiative UNEP uh, takes and Atulji has taken, which is to involve people, uh, is, is the way forward. Uh, and I thank you all. And I look forward and I compliment Mobius Foundation for this wonderful initiative. Thank you. Back to you, Rambuj. You are, you are muted. Rambuj, you are muted. I am muted. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. Speakers. I have stop video pin ahead profile picture hide. Oh my god. You can't hear me. Let me just try out. Sir, everyone is able to hear you. Ah, everybody can hear me? Yes, 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 very much. Okay, you okay. By the host, so for that reason. Oh, I'm so sorry. In fact, uh, it was, I don't know. This is the technological glitch which Karthik Bhai mentioned. I think it's a very, very That's tragic cool. to hear about that young girl in Kerala committing suicide because she cannot join the uh, this through the baby web. So the, these are the horrible stories, the nightmares that we are hearing from teachers and students on the online. That is one challenge. The other one, I think you mentioned about the uh, the lifestyle, the 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 challenge, which I think uh, C has been working in this area right from the 1992 Earth Summit. And uh, of course, the Paris, uh, when this climate agreement was being signed, the, the beautiful volume that you produced, the Parampara. These are, I think, uh, now in the context of COVID is being talked about and they are very, very relevant. The other aspect, the other dimension is about the microbes, the, the trillions of microbes, which are uh, in the context of COVID, the, this coronavirus, this is very relevant. Uh, I think, thank you so much, Karthik Bhai. Now we move over to uh, the special address by Dr. Pramod Kumar Sharma, uh, Senior Director, uh, FEEE. I think you all know about uh, the Foundation for Environment Education, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, one of the uh, globally well-known organization. And uh, 
Dr. Sharva, uh, of course, we both work together uh, with CE, with Kartikeya Sarabhai. And uh, now he is running a very uh, ambitious programs, Eco Schools, LEAF, and Young Reporters for Environment. And uh, he is going to speak on the, uh, particularly the COVID situation and how education and sustainability education responding to that. Uh, be, without taking much time, may I request uh, uh, Pramod to take over the floor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rampoch. Uh, I need to share the screen just a minute. Okay, you can see my screen, right? Dr. Rambuch, you can see my screen? Yes, yes. yes, yes okay. very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rambuch, for uh, this opportunity to be able to share the work we do. And uh, Dr. Berman also for continuing this initiative and uh, uh, mentoring it. Uh, I, just I was recalling when Dr. Rambuch was introducing Kathy Bhai that I'm also one of the beneficiaries of his mentorship. Uh, I was, I think, selected uh, by him and then mentored for many years. Uh, it, and we, and one of the first projects that I did at C was with Dr. Rambuch in Bihar. So that that is the kind of training that I got from both of them, uh, which enabled me to be part of uh, mentoring and running a global uh, program as uh, Foundation for Environmental Education. So uh, FEE is a non-profit organization, it's a member-based organization. We are now around uh, 100 members in 79 countries and we run five educational programs. Uh, all the programs are at least 20 to 25 years old. Eco Schools and FEE Eco Campus is the formal education program that the foundation runs. Learning About Forest is the program that is uh, basically focusing on outdoor education, very well connected to the theme of uh, this World Environment Day. The young reporters for the environment focuses on the thought leadership and brings in the ability of the young people to be able to use the social media that they use a lot for uh, changing uh, and in influencing the, the action for uh, environment or environmental conservation. And the other two uh, tourism based program are Blue Flag and Green Key. Uh, as I mentioned, we are a member-based organization and we are represented by Center for Environment Education in India. They run the program uh, on behalf of FEE in India. So globally, there are in eco schools around 60,000 schools uh, which are part of it and around 19.6 million students are involved uh, with 1.4 million teachers uh, mentoring the, the students for an environmental conservation every day, I would say. This is the spread of uh, countries that implement the eco school program globally. And last week, we also got one more new dot on New Zealand. New Zealand joined the eco school program. We'll be taking it up later this year. Uh, program is also known as a seven step process. So we are a process driven uh, uh, program and focus on how the education has to be carried out and uh, which is basically starting with a student driven program of selecting a committee, doing an audit and a review, identifying the problem, prioritizing them, teachers identify how they will uh, include those issues and problems in the curriculum and educate children about it along with the, uh, the, the standards that they have to do or the academic performance they have to uh, achieve during the year. Then action plan, implementing the action plan, monitoring, and then through an informed and involved staff, we engage with the stakeholders and particularly the parents. And then the experience of the entire year is then documented as an eco code, which is a live document, which then defines the ethical principles by which the sustainability is taken up by the, the school or the institutions. Uh, so in, when we look back that uh, we, we also had to respond to this situation because it impacted uh, uh, all our members in a big way and the schools that we work with. So the first thing that uh, I think uh, which we started doing was uh, helping to move the assessments online. And this is a new uh, 
uh, important uh, learning that we got because there was a lot of resistance of using technology and physically doing all the an, an assessment review and kind of thing. But uh, this fast forwarded the plan that we were trying to have is that with such a large not network, how can we do auto assessments and using technology? And we got a very wonderful experiences of teachers and students coming to uh, for the review online and then uh, doing that uh, assessment processes using Zoom and other uh, technological media. The second thing that we started doing is that you looked at the seven steps. So the environmental review and action, those two steps we shifted from school to home uh, kind of situation. And we uh, encourage students to take action and uh, do things uh, what the way Kathike was explaining, uh, exp explaining like looking out of the window and basically appreciating the things that are around them, which they might be overlooking or may not have really looked at uh, in a regular uh, <coughs> world. And the activities we, we were conscious about is that we should not increase screen time, but then use the screen time through the webinar and to basically uh, encourage them to uh, do actions at their home and within the home uh, premises or whatever conditions the countries were in because the diff there were a situation like curfew in some countries and then the, some countries are allowed children to or parents to take children to nature areas so how we can use those uh, different uh, rules and regulations that have been put uh, to address the issue of COVID-19 and then this we also find uh, an important opportunity for intergenerational connection. Uh, there were a lot of uh, issues uh, here because uh, children in many countries were advised not to uh, where the grandparents were living in separately, uh, which is a situation most in most of the Western countries, uh, that they should not meet uh, them or physically uh, be with them uh, because of their vulnerability to COVID-19. So how can our activities be connected uh, to uh, encourage them to talk to them and increase uh, the intergenerational connection and understand the difference in consumption and their time and that uh, uh, in the time the children are leaving. And we uh, fast forwarded uh, the professional development work that we are doing through a lot of webinars uh, for different stakeholders, uh, adult basically. And uh, we are in process and we were in process of launching Free Academy in 21, but then we fast forwarded and by uh, started putting it together. And uh, hopefully this will be the one of the important uh, online learning platform for teachers and the, net, uh, the uh, people engage in environmental education. And uh, then uh, our networks and programs also uh, started supporting the governments, especially where our fragile education system, we talked about uh, the digital divide and all those things, that how the activities can be done at home and then how environmental education can achieve the goals. Because ultimately uh, what it also happened that it moved from academic to skills in many countries. That is the, also a transition that I saw that people started focusing on uh, what skills that need to be learned instead of what content need to be learned. And then how those skills can be also fostered with different activities that can be done at the home. And uh, especially parents appreciated because this gave them an easy idea of how those skills can be developed at home. And then uh, we we basically also uh, instead of developing or developing our own resources, uh, curated and compiled the work that being done like uh, our school is one and other to basically amplify the resources that have been produced by different organizations. And these are the some of the organization. Basically, the first one is an activity we suggested called Care and Share connecting with your grandparents. The second activity is very similar to what Kathika said, look out of the window, document the, the things that you see, and then talk about the issue that you see, which could be anything from waste to biodiversity, could be water. And we found uh, many things interesting. For example, one child saying that I never noticed the tree outside my window. And I now see that there are so many uh, uh, species that, uh, uh, that you can find around that tree. And, basically uh, notice the biodiversity which was she was oblivious basically she comes from a nation country with uh, urban kind of thing and then a uh, lot of resources for this is a page uh, screenshot from england which put together themes uh, and for every uh, week they came out with resources uh, for the school which the activities can be done at home and these resources are available for free so you can also use and download those resources 
Uh, similarly, Cape Pace Diary came out with a lot of resources, mainly focusing on water, biodiversity, uh, waste minimization, and then looking at, because this is also the spring season in uh, England, Wales. Uh, so looking at the butterfly that are there around their homes and things like that, and make that connection. And they were just were given observation sheets to look at uh, those and then uh, document and then share it. And it was very popular. It's not many schools are there, but 800 schools across Wales uh, uh, use these resources and participated in this campaign. Uh, VESA, this is also a learning that uh, is there from the developing country. They responded, but then there was a problem of digital divide, but then they came up with a plan and are supporting the government to support the water sanitation uh, in the new COVID-19 situation. They are, they are coming out with educational resources to help teachers when the schools reopen to basically stem uh, the infection uh, that might happen or the transmission that happened. Also, I think one realization uh, when we look at the stories that came from developing countries is the nutrition loss that happened. Because in many developing countries, the midday meal scheme is an important nutrition support that a school provides. And there was a break in that. And they are also preparing that uh, how we can then create resilience among schools and communities. So that if this kind of situation comes, uh, how the, the nutrition security is uh, still provided or is there for the children. Similarly, uh, Bahamas, I'm just trying to put one or two stories from the different parts of the world. Uh, India, which uses the handprint as an approach, look, looked at waste, energy, healthy, biodiversity and water as a theme and uh, suggested activities that can be done at home and support uh, the educational processes. And more than 200 students participated. And then also uh, you can go through the website and found that many parents also found that activities interesting and they created videos and shared their uh, activities. Uh, learning about forests, that is the second program that we focused on uh, auditing the biodiversity, mapping the biodiversity, and then talking about the biodiversity uh, with, through looking out of the window. And then the Young Reporters for Environment, because that was already there in the digital space, focused on uh, looking at the challenges, stay home challenges, and then uh, created a wiry hub and uh, provided students with uh, competition and campaigns where they can uh, create videos, get a, uh, uh, engage in creative ways and share those uh, outputs on the website and our other resources or channels that we have. You will find, you please go and see those uh, stories because there are very interesting uh, stories uh, at that place. For example, there are two examples. Uh, some students uh, in Portugal uh, basically interviewed the frontline uh, health workers, nurses, and what kind of challenges they are going through, what kind of support they need, and how I mean, appreciated that uh, work, and then publish it in the media. Uh, and uh, then some students uh, research and put a story of uh, that, how COVID-19 is an opportunity for the environment, what we can learn and what how we can live uh, in an environment-friendly way after this. So a lot of content of uh, generation and thinking that went into uh, um, to basically learn from this situation and uh, for a future scenario. And then not webinars and like that kind of thing, and up to 170 people part participated in uh, what, uh, that uh, using the wall that is there it doesn't help and we use uh, we experimented with a lot of other technological input that can be used along with zoom like mentimeter and all, all those things and uh, so how can kind of thing and that's what also i think uh, kathike was mentioning that this is the skill curve the teachers need to go through because they are uh, comfortable and trained into a classroom face-to-face -face situation but when you go online how do you really engage them with the same kind of uh, engagement and processes. The second is that no topic is done and dusted. Uh, we felt that we will, if we give new topics and new ideas, those will get more attention. No. Things that have been there for as in themes and topics for 2025 years got more attention. So don't think uh, that uh, this something which is outdated. Any There are there is audience for uh, uh, every topic, everything that you would like to present and share. 
and digital divide is real. I think uh, we are seeing those stories, but there are opportunities because uh, in those situation uh, where internet is weak, many countries are using uh, WhatsApp effectively, which requires a low, lower bandwidth. And uh, getting a teacher or a student, how they do it with an expert is a good idea. That works the best. That so just don't quit an expert, but get a practitioner or a teacher or a student to, along with the student, uh, the, the expert, that makes the best uh, learning experiences. Uh, also, what we saw was that participation has a pattern and there were more participants from countries that are developing or are less developed in the Western countries also. And uh, there is more hunger where there is less resources uh, for learning and professional development. So this also, uh, we were able to map out that from where our audience is coming and uh, where the, there is a more need of professional development. Respect time zones, basically you cannot expect everybody to. So what we did was that we conducted the same seminar twice during the next two weeks. So morning and evening so that people can uh, participate and engage uh, without any inconvenience and then support for public schools uh, in developing world. And that, has, that is what we are trying to do, generate more resources, because there are issues of poor sanitation, overcrowding, water shortage, which make them a COVID-19 uh, situation, not bomb uh, for infection. And then food security in school and communities. You can follow us on uh, our Facebook website, and uh, you can contact Center for Environment Education in India uh, for more information about uh, the programs in India. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pramod. Uh, I think you gave a very good insight into how FE is responding to uh, this new normal, uh, particularly uh, your uh, proposition that uh, the digital divide uh, could be an opportunity as well uh, in certain situations. Of course, it's real, but there are new ways uh, people are trying to uh, find out new ways how to deal with it, particularly this online uh, use of interactive tools, engaging uh, students and learners is very, very important and no, no topic is done and dusted. This is again very good. I would like to mention here about the your I, YRA, uh, the Young Reporters of Environment uh, reporting uh, from his while staying at home. Uh, this is very interesting because this keeps uh, these uh, young reporters uh, involved. They research, they uh, do very innovative things and write about it. We have the experience during ICSC, uh, how quickly these young reporters, they used to produce uh, everyday newsletters. So we would uh, like to uh, engage with the, these reporters who, who participated in uh, ICSC uh, very much uh, in future endeavors. Thank you very much, Pramod. Now let us uh, move to the real school campuses. Uh, we have with us uh, uh, Ms. Seema Bali, and she is uh, doing a very good uh, the Green Campus program. She is with the St. Mary's School, Dwarka, New Delhi, and very interesting, innovative experiments uh, they are doing the Green Campus. And I would like to invite uh, Ms. Bali to take the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. Rambuj. Each and every one of us can make changes in the way we live our lives and become part of the solution as stated by Mr. Al Gore himself. Good evening, everyone. It's indeed a privilege to be a part of this platform where like-minded people, we all have gathered here to share our experiences and share our perspectives of this pandemic. Each one in our own niche have different challenges. And uh, my talk today is quite, um, is, uh, are my thoughts which are quite local and focused to the school community and uh, it is around the SDG 4, that is quality education. That's what we had been focusing from last two months, uh, which I feel personally, uh, I also teach classes 11th and 12th. I feel that I was very successful in engaging the students for two months, but I'm not sure if the learning outcomes have been achieved or not. 
So that's yet to come, like uh, Mr. Rambu just stated about the assessment and evaluation. So that the time will come, how much of uh, teaching learning transaction has actually happened. Engagement was 100% that I can say. So, um, you know, what is happening is that in the school community, uh, the impact of COVID is going, is, uh, you know, is far reaching as far as economic and societal consequences are there because we have mixed bag of students coming from different backgrounds from uh, especially students from economically weaker sections and uh, children with special needs so we have to uh, we had been uh, following a lot of um, activities and through a lot of campaigns even during this pandemic we have we were making asking the teachers and students who had extra mobiles or devices to share with the children who did not have the devices devices so that you know we can bridge the gap somehow because uh, they were uh, short of um, devices in their house because there are two three children in the same house and they could not uh, share it so we tried to arrange all that and then we tried our best but in a school scenario the challenge of uh, uh, the challenge is not only arranging the devices it's also to gauge how much is too much for them uh, five periods a day with so much of screen time was quite challenging and you know by the end of the fifth period or meaning fifth class they were exhausted mentally and uh, physically also sitting in the same position um, there are uh, n number of proposed plans to exit the lockdown scenario but uh, we have to get on going with our own plans and we have to use our school uh, infrastructure what is available and that's what we had been trying for the last few weeks uh, our principal and the team of teachers we had been brainstorming that how we have to exit this situation whenever it comes Though we will follow the advisory, we will follow all that, but we have to use the resources and the infrastructure that is available with us. We have to, I think, go back to the basics and connect to the nature and promote experiential learning. Because uh, content-based learning had been there, um, hands-on had been there, was there and children were doing it. But learning through experience goes a long way. That's what we have realized and we need to, uh, you know, quickly switch on to that. Also, you know, we were a very proud recipient of the green accreditation for our school from um, with the help of uh, the Climate Reality Project and um, CII. It had been a journey. It had been a journey which was, uh, you know, worth um, uh, sharing with you all. I would uh, share it in my presentation uh, after I finish uh, t uh, telling you that the challenges are there in school right from sanitizing a pencil as small as sanitizing a pencil to as large as a bus and we feel safe in our own homes so this uh, was the award that we the accreditation that we received the green uh, indian green building council and um, to achieve this it was not easy and we had gone through all the parameters and managed to get this with the help of parents teachers and students so what we focus in our green campus is that a green campus is one that should be sustainable. It should promote uh, you know, good healthy habits and ultimately it should be happy. So we look at these three areas and include and incorporate all these factors in our curriculum. But now more now after uh, the lockdown because we are our whole strategy is going to change. Though we all know that these are the areas of sustainability and these are the areas where we have to continuously work upon. But uh, how are we going to integrate and incorporate like uh, Mr. Kartikan also mentioned that we are doing. Where, are, where is the change? Where, where can we see the change? Why are we not seeing the change? It is because we are not incorporating and integrating it with our subjects. If we do perfect teacher training and you know if they include in their lesson plans which SDG they are touching in their lesson, uh, how are they incorporating one particular factor in their lesson? That's how we can incorporate. We do not have, we should, uh, SDGs are there everywhere. You can connect it with anything. 17 is a big number. If you find out, you will find the interconnection also and you can find that, you know, it has got scope for each and every subject. So it is upon us. To include that whether it is clean uh, air whether it is clean water whether whether it is uh, water management the all this the entire school can be created as a big huge lab and 
you know, if we are supposing we are talking about clean energy, we have, you know, we got the accreditation because we had fulfilled all the parameters, but that was about accreditation. What next? The next thing is that if we are talking about energy efficient electrical appliances, if we are talking about using air coolers in, instead of ACs because they give off CFCs, all these points that are written here should be included in our curriculum consciously. Now, this becomes experiential learning. We have exhaust in our classrooms which uh, throw out the air from the class. Now, even after, uh, you know, after the lockdown situation, the um, air inside the classroom where children, students will be sitting, even we are assuming that will be at least 20 students. I don't know what the, we are all still waiting for, we are still waiting for the advisory, but maybe supposing there are 20 students, the air inside has to be pumped out. The corridors, in the corridors, we have got huge coolers, you know, duck back coolers that, you know, which give cool air in both the sides of the corridor. These cool air is being pumped inside the, uh, is, uh, you know, sucked in by the exhaust. It keeps the classrooms uh, cooler and also takes out the air that is there inside. We may try, we may tell the students continuously. We have to tell them about even, you know, even I think they'll not, we will not even allow them to take the, their pens and pencils and notebooks back home with the fear of, you know, them, them getting the bug. So even those have to be sanitized maybe twice a day, maybe once when they come in the morning and in the afternoon after break, once they have interacted with so many people. So with so many students, so uh, that is there, but we cannot lose hope. And we, with four members or three members in the house, we find a house as a comfort zone, as the most safe place. And it really gives us goose flesh when we feel that, you know, in, a, in, a, in our school where we have 2,500 students. And even if we think that, you know, we have to start with 50% of students, that's around 1,200 students coming into the school building. It really gives us the chills that how will we manage, how will we, you know, uh, practice uh, social distancing. So we can use the green area that is there, you know, uh, the green area that is there, the green, uh, the turf cover, the green, uh, the gardens that are there, the lawns that are there, the ground that is there, and the classes can happen there so that children can, you know, they had been in front of the, uh, you know, um, computers for quite some time. Now, these are certain, some of the standard operating procedures, which we feel that, you know, in this time of, uh, uh, you know, preparedness, that's what, what, what will save us from, a, you know, a crisis later on is preparedness. So it's imperative that we all, that all schools must be, they, they are all working on this. I, I, I knew there are no, no few schools which are working on this and uh, we will be following the guidelines which will be given. So formation of a crisis management team is very important on each floor where we have two contact points and students should be made aware. You know, we have smart boards that these are the teachers whom you have to get in touch with in case, you know, so a lot of training has to go, a lot of orientation in terms of uh, students, teachers, parents, all stakeholders, even the support staff has to be trained well in advance to uh, face any crisis later on. The infirmary, though it is equipped, it has to be again revamped, tweaked, and all the you know, we have to make a rooster kind of a thing where in, um, the equipment and uh, the linen, the uh, washrooms, the knobs, the taps, everything has to be sanitized. Again, biodiversity, as I already mentioned you, is a good ground for teaching. It is a good, it offers us a good teaching learning space and we can observe social distancing. And uh, why we always think that, you know, classrooms are for uh, teaching and learning and grounds are only for PT and games and this and that. We have to change our mindset and we have to switch a bit and tweak a bit our uh, modus operandi in terms of uh, executing and even planning of uh, making the timetable for the day. We have to see who all are coming and how we have to engage them even the length of the periods so that all the activities are incorporated and children do not have a back foot and they can bridge the gap and enjoy their uh, school uh, schooling the way that it should be. Uh, we have to organize a lot of, uh, you know, the preparedness also includes organizing floor signages and uh, instructions to facilitate movement in the corridor, maintaining social distancing, whether it is while coming into the school building or leaving the school building or uh, managing uh, the queue near the canteen. Even that has to be managed. Even uh, then there has to be certain rules, even, you know, for breaks. I think we'll have to have multiple breaks you know, for students, few students going out at, at, at one point of time and then, you know, 
there will be no one common break a uh, lunch lunch period uh, how they are going to uh, you know it, that's going to interfere with the periods also we'll have to see we may plan now but when the execution part will come we'll have to definitely change because school is a place that whenever we plan something and come um, it doesn't happen that way we'll do everything we'll be busy from morning till afternoon but we wouldn't have done what we had planned for the day because it's so evolving dynamic something or the other keeps happening a big goal here is to lift the happiness quotient of all stakeholders that is the parents teachers and students and ensure good health and well being for all again uh, focusing on the uh, you know the one of the sdgs for good health and promoting that in our own schools so that you know we can create the ripple effect in the society and that's how from one school to the other and to our uh, teaching community and the schools we can be an example all of us can be an example and the future citizens which i think mr karthik after 10 15 years will not complain that this transaction is not happening and then you know we will see a change if we catch the children young in during their formative years this is the time to catch them and tell them that they are the pioneers of the new change so once they know that they are the pioneers and they are the ones who are going to take the new normal forward i think will bring a big change thank you so much and wish you all the best i hope uh, i made myself clear thank you uh thank you very much uh, seema ji i think you gave a very good uh, description of what your school is doing uh, practically particularly uh, the experiential le experiential learning component that you have introduced in the school is i think very encouraging and how you can devise and innovate uh, in the new normal which of course when the schools reopen and you have prepared a standard operating procedure and these are all based on the sustainability principles i think other schools must learn about it particularly the happiness quotient for all i think that should be the goal uh, for everyone of course challenges and the solutions are different in every region uh, we listen to indian experience and perspective and now we shall listen to international perspective this will give a new dimension to this webinar and uh, i welcome mr ben green a uh, geography teacher and head of outdoor education with gift school london uh, this is one of the almost more than 400 year school uh, and uh, we have partnered with the school for the mobius foundations uh, a very ambitious project of world environment school and a group of teachers from the school participated in the international conference on sustainability education and uh, i think it would be very exciting to listen to uh, what they have been doing in the area of uh, sustainability and global citizenship education which they have incorporated into their program uh, i welcome Uh, Mr. Ben Green, and uh, invite him to uh, say a few words. Mr. Green. Uh, hello to all delegates and speakers uh, from around the world. Thank you for this opportunity to contribute towards the discussion on the role of education for sustainable development. It's been very interesting to hear um, perspectives from schools in India and how the, the education is going with regards to sustainable um, development. Uh, as a way of a brief introduction about myself i'm currently in charge of global citizenship teaching at wicket school which as you mentioned is a large independent school on the edge of london as a teacher of geography and head of outdoor education my degree from the university of east anglia in environmental science has fostered a deep concern for environmental issues and when the school announced a curriculum review 2 years ago i jumped at the chance to introduce global citizenship and sustainability into the school I would like to spend uh, my 10 minutes today explaining sort of the rationale and strategy behind our project at Wick. Um for me there's never been a more important time to embed global citizenship and sustainability in education. I'm just going to share my screen with you. hopefully that's come through uh can you just confirm if you can see the screen is that yeah we can see 
Excellent, thank you. So, yeah, in preparing for the Global Citizenship Scheme of Work, I found a very concerning statistic that has stuck with me ever since. So in a 2015 survey, only 4% of the UK population were even aware that the Millennium Development Goals existed. To me, it's a real shame that UK citizens were largely oblivious to the great work being done around the world to improve the lives of millions. It is important that we celebrate success, and this statistic is a failing of educators and publicists to promote the great work of the United Nations. And it, it might also help to explain the, um, the link earlier where we talked about the geometric increase in environmental degradation, despite our attempts to try and incorporate sustainable education. This has to change if we are to move in the right direction towards a sustainable future. As we as a species have created a world that needs to be fixed and fixed very quickly, we need to avoid irreversible climate change before 2050, reverse biodiversity loss in our oceans, wetlands, forests and more. We must clean up our oceans, halt and reverse desertification and design and engineer a new zero carbon economy to name a few. At the same time, we need to make major improvements in access to education, prevention of hunger, equality in all its different forms, clean water and sanitation, and ensure peace and justice for all. The current generation of students will have a huge burden of responsibility that we have given them. They will be tasked with tackling all of the problems and issues that I've mentioned, and they will be asked to do so in an unreasonably short period of time. Our responsibility now is to prepare them for this challenge. Disappointingly, our generation have done a very poor job as custodians of the planet. There's been a lot of discussion and good science, but nowhere near enough political will or action. We have talked a very good game, but delivered very little. The least we can do is to prepare the next generation as well as we can for the huge challenges that lie ahead. The question we are all probably here to answer is how do we do that? That is the question that I asked two years ago when tasked with working out a strategy to incorporate sustainability into the school curriculum. So where did I look? So first, the national curriculum, it has some good links to the key issues. However, for me, they are not grounded in a central vision or purpose. I find that traditional education prepares students quite effectively with skills and knowledge. But what is often missing are the key attributes of empathy, global perspective, a development of the feeling of empowerment, and most importantly, action. I found, for example, a fantastic IGCC option in global citizenship. It includes community level action projects, which is brilliant. And I hope to introduce the course to Wikif one day, but realistically, how many students around the world will choose this option? A lot less than that 4%, I would imagine. Therefore, I concluded that, very importantly, global citizenship needs to be interwoven into all subjects. It also needs to be taught as a standalone subject in the early years so that students understand why it is so important and the vision can clearly be explained. Essentially, new concepts such as sustainability and global citizenship need to be firmly embedded in the minds of young students so that the terms are normalised and the feeling of empowerment and taking action are not seen as unusual. We must be careful not to preach to students, but instead to tap into their natural curiosity and attributes. So the next question I asked was, what do students like? Over the years that I have taught, I've observed the following. They certainly like to be rebellious. They are more inclined to take action if it's part of a cause. This taps into the team sport philosophy. Young people go a long way if they are doing something as part of a team, if there is a goal to strive for, and if there is a chance, however small, of winning. They like to fight against injustice. What do students not like was another question. I don't think they like to be told what to do by adults anymore. They don't like rules and they certainly don't like injustice. This is why I think Greta has been so incredibly successful. She has shown what can be done well before the voting age. She has empowered students to realise that they can do much more than they might initially think. Students tuned into her rebellious nature, her sense of injustice, and willingness to be frank and brutally honest about the world on a world stage. There seems to be a belief that now is our time for young people. There is a new generation who are not bound by traditional structures or modes of communication. And this is the backdrop for what I've tried to introduce at Wicked School. So what have we actually done? Well, firstly, the vision. What is the goal that we're all working towards? I want students to feel the excitement of knowing that by being asked to become global citizens, with understanding of sustainability, that they are part of something much bigger, that there are goals, defined targets, aims and deadlines. This is why our global citizenship at Whitgift has its foundations in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
It also shows that there's a battle we can win because the last challenge was successful. With the Millennium Development Goals, most were achieved despite initially appearing too ambitious. It also allows students to think about global issues and then stimulate them to realise that big changes can be achieved by everybody acting locally. The old adage of think global and act local is great, but possibly too limiting for the current generation. Greta has shown that students should now think global and act on whatever scale you feel able, whether it be local, regional, national or global. So to summarise, I use the Sustainable Development Goals and Oxfam's Education for Global Citizenship as the central pillars of the syllabus. So as you can see on the slide, so each topic had to be linked to a goal and also to an Oxfam Global Citizenship theme. The topics and themes become more sophisticated each year to ensure that students are able to engage in the topic. For example, recycling plastics for students aged 10, yet peace, security and the role of the United Nations for those aged 14. Ten-year-old students are taught global citizenship in a timetabled subject to give them a good foundation. I think this is important so that subjects can flourish later on. This is an example of an introduction to a new topic for 10 year old students. Straight away we want to tap into the emotions that the topic evokes. In subsequent years the topics are interwoven into lessons in other subjects. Each department has a global citizenship representative and we meet to ensure that syllabuses are being developed to include topics and themes at every opportunity. In addition 12 year old students also produce an independent project known as Ignite and these projects are based upon global citizenship themes. This has been run as a pilot in the first year, but the aim is to roll timetabled lessons out to all pre-exam year groups in coming years. Importantly, the lessons are designed to empower and not to lead or spoon feed. Each topic covered, students must choose the outcome, not teachers, and it's the outcome that they feel inspired to follow. These are some ideas in order <laughs> to stimulate creativity, but the students are always encouraged to think outside the box and to be original. So, some of the highlights of what we've had so far. So some students have set up um, using their own initiative, a green team club without any encouragement from staff. And the inspiration to do so happened to be this TED talk that I show here. It shows what needs to be done to engineer down to net zero carbon emissions. It is interesting to me that the inspiration came when students were presented with the solutions. It makes action easier and also rooted in high quality science. Four 10 year old students also felt empowered enough to talk in assembly about food waste. A group of 10 year old boys and their teacher ran a virtual 6K challenge on the 16th of May to raise money for World Vision. The 6K symbolised the average daily distance walked by people in developing countries in search of water. One student lives close to Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, and personally handed him a letter asking for more action in London on climate change. There have also been fantastic Ignite projects poems, speeches, posters, drama productions, and much more besides. I've received a lot of positive feedback from students and parents alike. Um, for us, this is just the start. If we were to do a poll when students leave the school, I'd very much like the stats to look something like the following. I'd want all students to be aware of the current sustainable development goals. I would like all students to be aware of their role as a global citizen. We'd like as many as possible to be involved in local community action towards meeting these goals. And also we'd like as many as possible to be involved in international projects um, as such. The resources of the course have largely been produced in-house, but as mentioned, the two key building blocks were Oxfam's Education for Global Citizenship and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, with a big emphasis on COVID, I thought as a final contribution, I thought it worth sharing my thoughts about the lessons we can learn from COVID and incorporate into our teaching of sustainability. So pandemics have occurred throughout history. We've had scares, we have been warned by scientists and epidemiologists, but most countries did not invest the money that was advised when the time was right. This teaches us that we must trust science and computer modeling like never before. Science needs to be more respected and have more influence over policy. The classic phrase in the UK recently has been, we will be led by the science. In an emergency, it would appear that politicians listen to science, but this is too late. We are in an emergency right now, a climate, biodiversity, and an environmental emergency. Money can be found in emergency, literally trillions of dollars recently. 
it would have been an awful lot cheaper to spend the money on prevention, as was done in South Korea, for example. This message can be used in relation to climate change. Find the money now to decarbonize the economy and sequester necessary carbon, and we will save a fortune in the decades ahead. Thank you very much for listening. I'll hand back over now. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ben Green. Uh, I think uh, you gave a, a great insight into the education for global citizenship. Uh, this uh, aspect, uh, the former U United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki Moon, uh, I heard him once telling that uh, his Education First initiative, one of the prime factors uh, to initiate that Education First by the United Nations was to develop or to promote the education for global citizens is very very important for the sustainability education uh, in fact notion of educator as the knowledge holder who imparts wisdom to their pupils is no longer fit for the purpose of the 21st century education with the students they gain access to knowledge and even learn technical skills through several tools phones tablets computers and which is very much being uh, used nowadays. Now we have one more international speaker, Mrs. Uh, Sumedha Jaiwardhane. Uh, she is the principal of St. Paul's Girls School, Colombo, Sri Lanka. Uh, we had the opportunity to listen to her, interact with her uh, during the International Conference on Sustainability Education in September. And we are very happy to get her into this international webinar and uh, we will be very happy to listen to her experience of working in the schools of Sri Lanka. Over to you, Sumedha. Thank you, Mr. Rambu. Uh, good evening. The chief guest, Mr. Atul Bagul, Dr. Rambu, and all distinguished invitees. I am very happy to be a part of this webinar to share my thoughts in relation to my country, Sri Lanka. My topic is challenges and another new on sustainability education. The general education system in Sri Lanka initiated its first curriculum reform of the new millennium to prepare the young of the nation for an emerging complex and dynamic future while resolving a host of other problems that had arisen from knowledge-based public examinations. Steps were taken to introduce a competency-based, student-centered and activity-oriented approach to education with a variety of new models for developing curricula and curricular material. The new learning teaching environment that's coming to for allow the teachers to move into their new role of transformation. It is well matching and promoting sustainability education. But if we have a good system in education, when it comes into practical field, still we have a gap between school education system, university education system and job market in the world. The private sector and job market are still blaming our school system and university sector. School leavers are, and most of graduates are not trainable and not employable. They do not fully equip with modern technology and communicative skills to communicate with the rest of the world. Our president, His Excellency Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksha has a broad view towards new education system in Sri Lanka. And already made policies to proceed them very quickly and understood that we need attitudinal change through education. New curricula, more focus, make attitudinal change, changes in young generation towards biodiversity conservation. 
During this unexpected epidemic, teachers and students have explored, uh, explored uh, new living and working conditions in COVID year. Still, we all are adjusting and adapting to our online learning teaching process from home. Therefore, under the COVID pandemic situation, it is very needy action to build the technology integrated knowledge and skills among students to rebuild the new education community. Not like developed countries, most of our teachers are reluctant to use technology in their teaching learning process due to lack of experience with the technology, lack of inadequate computer technology support, time factor, teacher attitudes, and lack of professional development in computer technology integration. The scenario of e-learning has different trends in urban and rural areas in Sri Lanka. The lack of availability of internet devices and e-resources in most of rural areas and even some urban areas in common issue and also a challenge. Developing equitable teaching learning process in unequal society is a huge challenge for us, but we are enabling schools and teachers to share their competencies and resources and learn from each other. Promotes online teaching learning process, a little success. For an example, I am the leader of one of the cluster schools called Parcel Powder. Consists of six schools. My school share shares our resources with other five schools in my cluster. Further, we provide our V class facility to use not only schools in our cluster, all school over the country. We are uploading lessons, study packs, test papers in spm.lk website. It's my school website. Anyone can use this facility without any conditions. Honorable Minister of Education always guides us to fill the above mentioned gap to some extent. Most of the schools in Sri Lanka provide range of support to help both teachers and students to engage online teaching learning process. In my school, all teachers and students are facilitated with Microsoft Teams application. As all responsibilities are done by school and students and teachers are free from charges. I have observed some teachers are better at their online lessons than their in-class lessons as they use more exciting and innovative way of enhancing teaching and learning process. Further, Ministry of Education also facilitating students by using different strategies through Sri Lanka Rupwahini Corporation Sri Lanka Broad Broadcasting Corporation, Itaksala, and Nansen. The table is produced weekly, and students are invited to study at home television. Further, Ministry of Education, Provincial Education Departments, and Solar Education Officers have invited talented teachers to work as resource persons to continue an online education television and radio education programs. It provides more opportunities, a big number of students, even in rural area, to learn at home. It is like sharing and maximizing human resources. Further, conducting online demonstration workshops for teachers to equip them technical skills is not an easy task, as they request live training on technical literacy. Another challenge is how will online teaching and learning process benefit for all students? Students, those who are weak in subjects, cannot cope up with this online teaching. They need personal support. Even some of potential students, they need physical contact with teachers and real classroom environment to generate an interest to learn. Another challenge is different types of technical issues from students and teachers. Although, this, although Sri Lanka is a small country, wide range of background variations in students and teachers both. Sometimes 
teachers are updated with technology, students who come from rural area and semi-urban areas are not updated. Sometimes students are well equipped with technology, but lack of teachers who are literated with modern technology. Most of teachers have another issue. How we develop students' emotional intelligence through online. Although we reach knowledge and sometimes skills, how can we build up sensitive human beings through online? The leaders who have emotional intelligence can make the world sustainable. Although online learning teaching process is one solution at school education in COVID pandemic situation. As educators, we need to think more and more. At the very beginning of online, it was a very new experience for our, ch our school children, and they love it. In the time being, they are complaining that they love to live in real classroom with their friends. They complain there are no opportunities to question or talk when they need to clarify and their facial expressions are not seen by their teacher. Teachers also come with their complaints. They are very relaxed and happy at in class. As they see the uh, feedback of students quickly, an online classroom situation cannot be controlled by teachers. As some students leaving while lessons are going on, I saw a cartoon in Facebook. One student fixed his photograph in front of the web camera and he was sleeping under the table. This might be happen as school children now varied from grade 1 to 13. They are at vulnerable and they need very dynamic environment to learn. Although there are challenges, we have achieved new at COVID era on sustainability education. Teachers have started learn about new technology, do online preparations for teaching from home. Students are adjusting to learn online, although they have some issues. Young people have made innovations to avoid difficulties at COVID era. For example, innovative sanitizing machines, ventilators, water taps, etc. In recent past, our parents in Sri Lanka and teachers reluctant to give smartphones and electronic devices to young students. Now that attitude is already changed at COVID era and young children use these devices very perfect way in their learning. Now they have realized new technology is one of the best option in their learning than using technology for unethical activities. I have observed another new in school. When one teacher is teaching more than 100 students, sometimes 200 students in same grade, log into the same lesson at the same time, muted with their microphones and highly engaged into the lesson. They are only there are only 45 and 50 students learning one class at school at real situation. Further, students have good opportunity to join teachers they like. This is not a new in school education. There are cultural changes in Sri Lanka, even Sri Lankan society. People are very concerned about others, other health, health conditions than themselves. They always see whether another person is wearing a mask, maintain one meter distance, or whether they are washing their hands properly before entering the premises. Ma'am, and uh, ma'am, sorry, to interrupt. I, ma'am, I think we are entering into the questions part. Uh, the, what you are discussing are the questions part. They are to be discussed uh, in in the uh, uh, breakout rooms, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in conclusion, although there are challenges, we have achieved a lot in COVID era on sustainability. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity to me, share uh, my thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, ma'am. Thank you so very much.
Dr. Saab, please. Uh, thank you very much, Sameda. I think you gave a quite uh, new insight into uh, the teaching learning which is happening in Sri Lanka, particularly your uh, this coming together uh, by the web, students and teacher helping each other is very, very uh, innovative. Uh, one aspect that you mentioned that teachers, many of teachers are better uh, on the web rather than in the classroom. That's quite encouraging. Uh, thank you so much. I think this is the end of the uh, the speeches. Uh, we thank and we are grateful to our chief guest, uh, Sri Atul Bagai. Uh, keynote address uh, was given by Kartikeya Sarabhai, who has already left. Uh, my friend uh, Pramod Sharma from FEE, Ben Green, uh, Sumedha and uh, Seema. All thank you so much. And uh, I think now I would like to hand over to Mr. Aditya Pundir, Country Director, Climate Reality Project, to explain about what we are going to do further uh, on the this conclave, how we are going to divide ourselves into breakaway groups and doing the very important deliberation of the this international webinar. One request for everyone, I think I would request everyone, all our distinguished guests, as well as all the participants to be present tomorrow as well, because today's deliberation will be, the outcome will be presented tomorrow. And we have very distinguished from UNESCO, from UNEF, from many other institutions in the field of sustainability education. Thank you very much indeed. Over to you, Aditya. Aditya, are you there? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think I was muted by the host. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This yeah, happens. Because, uh, some, this happens in this uh, seminar. Yeah. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for to everyone. It was a great listening to so many people. There were very good ideas. And I think uh, a lot of our principals out here today in the conclave will benefit from it. And uh, so since we are in the part of the conclave, I will not take much time. I will just very briefly put you through that why this we all are here today. As we all know about the challenges we are facing today. Today is the day of the COVID. Today is the year of COVID 2020. But then we are also looking at an even bigger challenge than COVID in coming years. That will be the recession which we are looking at globally. So there will be a huge global recession coming where money would become a real huge priority for everyone. So that's a second challenge. And third, of course, the biggest of them is the climate change. Because the way things are happening, climate change is happening. And by the time we realize like COVID, still we can find a vaccine. Uh, climate change, we, do, we won't be able to even find a vaccine. It will just take over and it will be just, won't go back. So coming to the solution part of it, these challenges is this very briefly, it always starts with activism. People fight, people protest, people go out onto the streets. Then the governments listen, they make rules. And after the rules are made, a technology is looked for probably which can solve those problems. Like we are looking for today in the COVID era, everybody is looking for that vaccine should, should come. So that's the technology. So how do you go from this time to the technology part? It's education. So that is the very important role which all the principals today here are playing. They're running institutions and that's why you, we are looking to you for ideas because to bridge the gap to technology and solution from the problem takes time. And that time is to be utilized in education. So we have to educate people. We have to get the things right. We have to nurture the smaller, the right from people in school, whether it's in college, we have to interact with them and see to it that we all move towards technology with the minimum of damage. So today, as soon as the schools were going to open, I think uh, a point which has been missing in this, everybody will be, uh, I was talking to a few parents, people don't want to send their children to school. So this is the one big challenge if every principal will face that the uh, parents are not willing to send their children to school if the government even opens in July. So how do you counter that? It will have a huge impact on the financial systems of the schools. 
especially the ones which are unaided, which are not the government schools, where will they arrange the finance from to run double shifts, to run with 20 people, have more staff for sanitation and cleaning. So these are the crucial challenges which I thought probably in this uh, discussion today, we can discuss, the principals can discuss in their rooms. And all the four questions, I'll quickly go through them. The first one, uh, uh, Bhavesh, will you be putting up a slide or should I just read them out? So, so the first question we are talking about is the sustainability issue, like how you are going to teach, how you're going to, going to teach all these things in your class the way you have been teaching. So that is the first question we want you to deliberate upon how the sustainability issues are going to matter. Then it will be followed by the second question. This is how can sustainability issues of biodiversity, climate change, environment protection, how you can talk about it in the campuses. So this is one question we would like you to think about, talk about. The second question we are looking at is the new normal. That this is what you are doing and you, we, want, we would like to know how you are doing. And the second question is what would be the new normal? Uh, Bhavish, can we have the second slide? What would be the new normal with the COVID now everywhere? What would be the new normal and how are we going to teach in the coming times? Uh, the second question, please. Okay. So after the thing, then the third question we are looking at is the scenario of e-learning that we have already. So first we talk about how we are doing it today. The best practices probably you can briefly discuss. Followed by the second question where you talk about how these practices are going to get impacted by this COVID era. The third thing we are looking at is e-learning and how I think every speaker has here talked about the, either the divide or how the challenges, the new challenges with everybody's facing. So probably we, you can discuss these, how it's happening, urban, rural, there's financial or incomes also involved because rich people can have uh, tablets and computers what about the poor children who do not have the tablets and computers at home will they be marginalized will they be left behind what about people in villages who don't have these facilities so probably this is again a huge challenge which we have to address as a society and finally the last question would be the way forward 